Thanks for tuning in to another telecast. Before this week's show, I wanted to remind you to sign up for our free weekly newsletter, Telecast Plus. It features interesting TV industry news stories from a different angle and exclusive content, such as Opinion and The Secret Producer, our anonymous TV exec reporting from the front line of TV production. Plus, we're bumping up the goodies with more free downloads of TV industry reports, discounts, and exclusive access to some live telecast events we're planning for the months ahead. And you'll only get access to those if you're on our mailing list. And don't worry, we don't like spam either, so we won't do anything weird with your data like sell it to advertisers or anything. Just sign up at our website by searching Telecast on Google or visiting telecast podcast. Dot com. Thanks a lot. Telecast, the TV industry news review. Is it boom time for Scotland's TV production sector? What about industry diversity in Scotland? And what happens to the country's TV industry in the event of Scottish independence? Find out on this week's Telecast. This week, we're taking a look at the Scottish TV industry, its past, its present and its future. And to help us look at the landscape, I'm delighted to welcome one of the most experienced TV producers, former director of content at STV Productions and now MD of Two Rivers Media, Alan Clements. And also joining me is BAFTA-nominated director and managing director at independent production company Create Anything, Stuart Chisimiri. Welcome to the show, Alan and Stuart. Hello. Hi, Justin. Delighted to be here. Great to have you guys on the show. It's been a while since we've looked at the TV landscape of a particular territory, and it struck me that we haven't focused on Scotland yet. So I'm delighted we've got you both on the show to, to help me put that right. Alan, coming to you first, you set up Two Rivers in 2018 after a decade as director of content at STV. What are the biggest learnings that you took from your time at STV to bring to your new business? Well, hi, Justin. Uh, As I said, absolutely delighted to be here. Um, What were the biggest learnings? I think diversity of genre. I think you learn about trying to hire the best people and you learn the importance of trying, particularly in an indie, to conserve cash at key moments. Okay. And so you produce both scripted and non-scripted content at Two Rivers Media. I Actually, we incorporated the company in January 2019, so we're two and a bit years old. And when I set up the company, I was really determined to set up an indie of scale in Scotland. Uh, because it felt to me that there was finally a brilliant opportunity to build something substantial outside of London. And I guess it wasn't just my experience at STV, but obviously at IWC Media before that, but obviously I was one of the founding creators in it and at Work Clements before that. And I guess one of the few benefits of being really old is that you try and use that experience <laughs> to your benefit. So when we set up Two Rivers I look for proper investment and we took on three investors to begin with. And so far, um, we've managed in the two and a bit years to survive both one of those investors going bust and the pandemic. So still here. So I'm, I'm taking that as a positive side. Absolutely. And that's obviously Q Media, right? Yes, it was Q Media. That is quite something. And, and and there is one other business I'm aware of who's had a similar been through you know similar hurdles extricating themselves from that uh, investment deal but also you know as soon as they've done that obviously the pandemic hit so it's a it's testament that that you're here and speaking to us on telecast and still presumably busy tell us what you're working on yeah I, and i would say on the q media we were very lucky we managed to extricate ourselves two days before they went into administration because if you're trying to get of a company that is Going into administration, it's incredibly difficult legally. But we get out and our current investors, Noble Grossart Investments and the Channel 4 Growth Fund, both stepped up to buy Q stake. So actually, we weren't disadvantaged in any way in getting out of Q. So we were one of the lucky ones because some of the very, very good companies were horribly affected by that. And it's probably actually better to have 
two investors rather than three, right? Purely from an admin perspective, but it must be a little bit easier. Well, you learn, you learn to manage the investors you have, and I'm, I'm really delighted. Uh, and Q were very supportive and helped get the company started, so I have no criticism of Peter and Stephen because they were very good to, to us, and I'm very sorry what happened to them. But no, two investors, three investors, four investors, I think you just learn to manage it. That's back to the experience. It has been a very busy year, particularly in factual and popular factual. Entertainment's been a little slower, as you might imagine, during the pandemic. And then the scripted business under Marcus Wilson was all, and his team was always going to be in a development phase the first two years of any company. So it really probably affected them least of everybody. I guess it's it's probably affected those production businesses that maybe four years ago decided that they wanted a drama division and spent the two years in development. And then when they had their numbers in the in the Excel spreadsheets, then they weren't allowed to sort of or able to to go out and, and win their pitches and start production, which is probably happened to a, a lot more companies than we're probably aware of. Yeah, I think that's I think that's certainly true. Uh, so if if you're going to have a pandemic, I guess we had it at the best time, <laughs> if that doesn't get too convoluted. I think we've come out of it stronger and we produced all the way through it. So on Tuesday this week, uh, a couple of days ago, um, we had a major film on BBC Scotland, now on the iPlayer, called Killing Escobar, uh, that was theatrically released. And we shot it during the pandemic in the UK, in the US and in Colombia. Uh, and we've also continued both with virtual filming and sending basic crews out to continue Escape to the Chateau and Escape to the Chateau Make Doing Men all the way through the pandemic. So I think we've done pretty well, uh, all things considered. Absolutely. And what else are you working on right now? I'm just doing the numbers with our head of finance this morning and, you know, that we are really hopeful of picking up some pilots and entertainment and the scripted developments are starting to come through. And I think that's testament to the team that joined at the start of Two Rivers and have remained. When we we were recruiting, we used a, a brilliant recruitment agent called Indigo Talent, that's right. We had them on the show a few weeks ago. So that's correct. And uh, I remember sitting with them in the Mortimer House Cafe, uh, their very nice headquarters. And I said, I only have two criteria for people. One, everybody moves and lives and works in Scotland. And secondly, no arseholes. In a hurry, we've got a lot to do, and we really want the best people. And she just she just burst out laughing and went, okay, that's the clearest brief I've ever had from any company setting up. <laughs> that is very clear and, uh, and quite right. And actually, I do share the same policy. The second policy point you talked about, I actually share that as well. So it's, uh, it, makes things, it makes life a lot easier. So this week, we're talking about Scotland, and we're going to come on to talk to Stuart in detail in a second. But just to set the scene of the TV production landscape in Scotland, Alan, can you give us an idea of how it's developed and why it's developed in the way that it is and and where's it at right now? Well, I would say, Justin, that one of the few benefits of being a veteran or being this old is that I've lived through at least at least three iterations of were moving the TV industry out of London. And this time, it is not only real, it is substantial, and more important, it is irreversible. Uh, and it's it's got its own momentum now. And so I think this is definitely the best of times to be an out-of-London indie. And I think the opportunities are great. It has been a very checkered record, by the major broadcasters, but it is definitely for real this time. And as well as the the demand for broadcasters for production from Scotland for the network, you also have an agency now in Screen Scotland under Isabel Davis and David Smith that understands television in a way that its predecessors didn't and are supportive of television because their predecessors were obsessed by indie film 
which is, in my view, struggles to be called an industry. You know, it's a creative force and very important, but it's not an industry the way television is. So Screen Scotland have been pivotal with the backing of the Scottish government at driving this growth as well. So there's been a kind of pull me, push you process going on that's been really, really good for Scotland. We were talking before the show, before we started recording, about the fact that it's not really a north-south divide. There's an east-west divide in Scotland because, you know, the, in terms of the infrastructure of TV production in Scotland, it's all in Glasgow, isn't it? There's, there's very little elsewhere. Is that, is that right? Yeah, it's, it's mainly in Glasgow. There's a little patch in Aberdeen and there's some um, ad agencies uh, in Edinburgh and a couple of the smaller companies, but by and large, it's in Glasgow. But it's interesting, Justin, I don't think that's just a Scottish issue. I think that's a UK issue. So if you look at a map of the UK and go down the West Coast and you look at Glasgow and Manchester, Stroke Salford, Bristol, Cardiff, there's there's really significant uh, centres of production all the way down the West Coast. If you go down the East Coast, Edinburgh, Newcastle, Leeds uh, and Norwich, it's only really Leeds uh, that has a significant basis and that's smaller than its rival in Manchester, you know, just across the Pennines. Uh, and then, of course, there's the great anomaly of Birmingham, which is such a, an exciting setting, such a major population and, and, and a very young population. And actually, it has probably less production than a place like Bristol, which is of a, a mystery in the UK as well. It is a, a fascinating the way that it, things seem to have evolved over the years. And obviously, the changes that have been announced recently by the BBC and Channel 4 and other broadcasters to really commit to building nations and regions, hubs and offices, and really have a quota of commissioning from local producers. That's that's really going to change. And that's obviously what you were alluding to. Yeah. In a lifetime packed full of mistakes, I think setting up a nations and regions indie right now is not one of them. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to come come back to talk to you a second about that because I I can imagine there's quite there's quite a few interlopers that are sh- setting up shop in Glasgow at the moment, but uh, uh, London Indies trying to cash in a little bit on this uh, local focus. But park that for the moment. Stuart, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Tell us about Create Anything. Uh, well, Create Anything is. Um, a production company we've been around for um, the past roughly year and a half. I am the managing director. We're just a, a very young company and we're trying to come into the industry with a different approach. Um, I come from digital background, uh, making content for online. So we're trying to diversify our content and find, I would say that we are, uh, we are, we are a colourful palette production company we we're a production company that will never have the diversity chat which we've all been having over the last last year or so young company looking to tell diverse stories i'm currently working on a a couple of dramas and a talk show we also are we're also a company that uh, started um television and film talent diverse talent pool called reframe which is launching at the end of the week we currently have like 500 plus CVs from diverse BAME and, you know, women, et cetera, et cetera. So we're just we're a two-pronged approach. <laughs> so you, you've also been directing as well, haven't you? You've been, you yes. were uh, nominated for a BAFTA award for a recent yeah. project. Tell us about that. Yeah, so that so people know me for uh, my documentary Black and Scottish that was aired at the end of 2019 on BBC, on BBC Scotland. It grew arms and legs. It was a documentary where, as I said, I've always been a filmmaker. So, you know, for years, being a six foot four black Scot traveling out, out, even in Scotland and outside of Scotland, I'd always hear we didn't know that there was black people in Scotland. And of course, I knew there was, and I knew there was ridiculously talented people coming, black people coming from Scotland. You've got people like Shitty Gatwa and, and uh, Emily Sandy, etc. So I, I knew of vast amount of talented individuals from all walks of life so obviously as a, a filmmaker and having access to cameras it's a case of right okay i think i need to rectify this and 
tell this story. Um, the documentary was centered around my daughter, Yasmin, and she, growing up in Scotland, I, re- I did receive um, racism and, you know, there was a lack of identity on my part. So I wanted to make sure that the next generation could um, look at, you know, find role models in, in Scotland instead of looking out, you know, outside of Scotland and, you know, giving her, letting my kids feel like they will always be accepted and, you know, they're, they're not different, they're unique. So it was centred around her and um, I started making, I started putting together a kind of sizzle sizzle reel um, for it. I started interviewing um, black Scots, uh, your everyday black Scots, talented individuals. And and, and then we, we pitched, we, I'm fortunate enough to stay in an area where for some reason there's loads of people from the BBC that live here. So I've managed to, to speak to a producer who then spoke to a production company and, you know, after pitching it to them and, and sharing the the video, a couple of weeks later we were talking about a commission and, you know, I worked with 10 Television and directed that documentary. It was mainly a Talking Heads documentary with a bit of actuality and the rest is history from there. It just grew arms and legs and uh, got a lot of you got a big audience and Netflix were talking about it and promoting it and other celebrities were speaking about it and, you know, people, that's how people kind of know me. Yeah, fantastic. Well, we'll put a link to Black and Scottish in the episode description so people can go and, uh, and check it out. And you said that was produced with Turn TV. You were director on that. I mean, you're presumably pitching your own projects now with a view to having create anything produce a project for a broadcaster yes and we already have we have another documentary out called bash the entertainer behind the smile it's a a social media star black black star millions and millions of followers and video views but he suffers from ptsd so it's the kind of what it's like behind the camera behind the smile so we have a a production there a co-production there we are in talks with the bbc for a couple of other projects which will solely be create anything because that's that's the one from the the networks that i'm working with is that no more cold pros we're just having a chat about no longer being a director for hire so that we can concentrate on running create anything and building your business yeah building the business so that's what we're we're doing just now we actually um are in a position where you know we've, had, we've speaking to a couple of companies about um, partnership and getting that kind of leg up injection of money for us to continue to do what we're doing. So I know it's an early stage just now, but for a company that's been around for over a year, we're already having that discussion. So really excited about that. Absolutely. Well, uh, congratulations on your success so far. Thank you. How, How difficult did you find entering the TV industry to begin with in Scotland? To begin with in Scotland, I was very, you know, just I was very, very lucky, extremely lucky because I'm self sufficient. You know, I, I came from an industry, a design and, and, and film industry part prior to this, and I was a contractor and I managed, I was, I was running Create Anything prior to that as a kind of design film and just company. And I managed to buy my own equipment, buy my own cinema cameras and, you know, lighting kit, et cetera, et cetera, because I also come from a cinematography background. So um, I was able to just go out and make a kind of high production, high value, um, five minute example of what black and Scottish should be like, you know, with lighting and, you know, um, and so I had that piece of content. And as I said to you, I live in an area in Glasgow called Broomhill and it's, it's, just across the road from me is two BAFTA winning directors and, you know, the head of BBC Children and exec, you know, execs at the BBC. So um, funny story was we were watching, my partner and I were watching something on television and we seen a credit and it was one of the mums, my daughter's, <laughs> daughter's friend's mum. And she's like, you know, there's this producer and she's in television. Oh, we should really good speak to her about black and scottish and i was like i can't do that and so we we're picking up our kids after school and she was there and my partner was like just go and speak to her so 
I just said, right, forget it. Let me just go and speak to her. And I showed her the trailer then and there. And I just seen her thinking about it. And she was quiet for a bit. And she said, this is interesting. Let me, let me speak to Turn Television. And then get a meeting with Turn. And they, they liked it and pitched it alongside another documentary, which was um, a Gail Porter documentary. Uh-huh. And then we were in the BBC BBC headquarters um, with Louise Thornton, who was the commissioner. And a couple of weeks, three, four weeks later, we were having the commission chat. They they liked it. So it was sheer luck. It was a case of just she was I was she was there at the right time. I was there. I, I know from speaking to other people that it would be a lot more difficult for them to get into the industry because even prior to that, I, I looked at production. I looked at contacting production companies and going on BBC Pitch website and trying to register and with no success. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a great story, Stuart, but actually it's not that unusual if you look at London, the school gates chat that that will be happening Uh, at Queen's Park and, you know, all of the other areas, Notting Hill. This has uh been going on for years. So uh, Broom Hill is the new centre of commissioning. So get your kids into school at Broom Hill. Oh, definitely. uh, (laughs) And uh, (laughs) do you know what's funny as well is the commissioner literally is across the road from my youngest um nursery so she's she's in she's like i'm going for a walk with her next next week yeah it's a people business isn't it really yeah. and that's what that's the the, the thing that that uh, mm-hmm. your story reinforces there's obviously a focus right now on making the tv industry more ethnically diverse and also regionally representative of the population now as a bame led producer in glasgow are you finding greater practical opportunities other than Obviously, you know, the networking that you're doing, presenting themselves to you right now in terms of commissioning. Yes. You know, we just had, BBC just had the diversity chat, which I help lead on that. I've had conversations with Ofcom as well about diversity. They're basically mitigating, making sure that the net, networks are following suit and also the amount of requests to come and direct this or that has been quite, you know, as I said, I've not been in the industry that long, but coming into the industry, I came into an industry where, you know, Black Lives Matter happened and, you know, a lot of companies awoke, um, production companies and networks, realising that they need to create more content, um, as I said, a more much more colourful palette. So, yes, I have seen a lot of black people that I know of in the industry that are getting a lot more work with scepticism in there as well, um, because a lot of them are saying that, Prior to that, they had, you know, no one was really speaking to them. They, just a few, few odd jobs here, here and there. But hmm. it, it seems to be. Hopefully, see, ask me in six months' time, a year's time, and I'll tell you if um, it's changed at all. But the discuss, the discussions are there, and the content is being is being made. There's a couple of um, networks out there that are trying really hard. You know, really going all out, like Channel Four's um, doing a thing called Black to Front. Um, yeah, which is which is quite good. So there's some changes. I'm not seeing immediate changes, but I know that the discussions are happening. Okay, well, things hopefully moving in the right direction. Many would say it's about time too, but that's yeah. it's great to hear. And and I'll take you up on that in a in a year's time. Let's have another chat and yes, and let's see how things have gone for you. Uh-huh. Now it's it's quite tricky to ascertain the value of the Scottish TV industry. Alan, you were talking about Screen Scotland and and the work that they've been doing. I've been trying to find some figures to work out what the value of the Scottish TV industry is. And the latest figure I can find is in the region of £100 million, but that includes film as well. In terms of growth, obviously, we're seeing the commitments from the uh, national broadcasters in the UK to Scotland and to, to commissioning more regional content. Are you feeling confident about the growth in the country's TV industry? Oh, most definitely. And I think you're about to be inundated with statistics because both Screen Scotland and PACT are about to do major pieces of uh, research on the size and and scale of the industry in Scotland. Again, maybe we should do this in a year's time, put that in the diary, and we'll be able to both come back and give you an update on how that's gone. I think it's a great time to be in Scotland and, and very much when I look at Two Rivers, it's the it's the right people in the right place at the right time. 
is the way we like to think about it. And I, I the the only the only thing I wouldn't be is being a middle class white guy setting up an indie in London. I think that would be a pretty disastrous thing to be doing right now. <laughs> but but yeah. apart from that, I think if if you're out of London and if you're from a diverse background, it, it's a great time uh, to be setting up companies. We're seeing lots of independent production groups and uh, medium-sized indies opening up shop in Leeds and in Bristol and in places like Glasgow to essentially try and, and pitch for that local money. That must drive you mad, surely. You know, you don't want more competition on your doorstep pitching for this regional money. And I know there's lots of different ideas on quotas and, and how a, how a production company is judged as to whether or not they are deserving of a local commission. What what do you think, Alan? Because you must have seen this develop over the years, and we'll mention no names about these type of companies, but it, it, it must be pretty galling to be going through the tough times as well as the great times as a producer in Glasgow or elsewhere in Scotland and, and to have these big, well-funded groups setting up going, we're a regional indie. I try not to be gold. Uh, I try to think that any production in Scotland is good for Scotland because it increases the skills base. And it's a bit like if you see an area of London or an area of Glasgow where two or three restaurants set up and it becomes a, a hub like Finiston in Glasgow, it's actually good for all the restaurants because people go there to eat food. So I think that all production from Scotland is good, but production from Scotland by Indigenous Scottish companies is by far superior. And I think a lot of the cynicism of lift and shift, you know, just moving shows here, is starting to die away. And the broadcasters realise that if you want to keep sustained production, you have to support local companies who, when the production's over, will still be there, as opposed to, you know, picking up sticks and leaving. And so... But all production is good. I don't think we can be little Scotlanders about it. I, I, I think if, if people come and they genuinely want to be here, like Lion Scotland have been here for a long, long time. Mentor's been in Glasgow for a long, long time. So I don't, I, you know, as long as people really mean it and they employ locally, instead of just bringing everybody up and then going back down again, then I, I don't have any issue around that. Coming to you, Stuart. So a, a resurgent Scottish TV industry from a creativity and an IP perspective, what can the Scottish TV industry bring to international audiences? Because obviously stage one is about being able to get, you know, a good string of national commissions, great, great commissions mm -hmm. from national broadcasters. But obviously step two is being able to go over to the States and sell shows and get commissions as well from international broadcasters. But what is the, the special ingredients that you think that Scottish TV can bring to the world? Very good question. Okay, firstly, I would say what I'm noticing is high-end television is massive right now. You know, you're, all you need to do is look at Amazon Prime and Netflix mm -hmm. and look at things like BBC's um, His Dark Material and it's a sin, Channel 4. They're spending film budgets on on television shows. So that's that's one thing that everyone sh should be bringing to the game, you know. But in the sense of Scotland, no, oh, that's a very good question. How about you, Alan? What do you think? I mean, is there an indigenous ingredient that you think is a magic touch that, that will really make the Scottish TV industry fly internationally in the coming years? I, I think that would be a slightly overblown claim, to be honest, Justin. But I think we do come from a great storytelling tradition. If you, if you look at, you know, uh, the writers and poets that Scotland has generated, and indeed always makes me smile when, when people talk about Nordic noir, and, uh, you know, as if the Danes and the Swedes invented dark crime. They obviously have never read or any read any Scottish crime books or indeed watched any episodes of Taggart, you know. Yes. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. we were definitely there first. And also what is exceptional is the, the quality of the of the scenery here is is the best in Europe, I would say. So yeah. You have advantages, but 
are, are we uniquely gifted? I think that's maybe a claim too far, to be honest. Yeah, that's that. That's the reason why why I was finding it difficult in the sense of uniquely gifted. I'm thinking what one of the advantages is of our, our landscape that we have, Scotland in general, the kind of Celtic background as well. I, I would say looking at what has made Scotland popular internationally. You know, you've got you've got is it Pixar that the there was there was a I think it was a Pixar movie, a, a Scottish film with. Oh, brave, yeah, yeah, that's it, brave. You know, so that is kind of internationally how the world, not the world sees us, but you know, we it'll be to do with something to do with the landscape. James Bond, for example, they've shot many scenes here, so the landscape and story and and story behind the landscape in Scotland is some of the key things we we're good at telling. Well, I was only just watching Skyfall, Bank Holiday Weekend, required viewing. Um, yeah, so yeah. that was brilliant. And I saw Highlander as well. And I know that Irving Welsh's new show, Crime, just started production in Scotland over the weekend as well. So there's uh, all of those things rolled into one there. This show goes out on the day that there are some important elections happening across the UK and particularly in Scotland. Now, the question is, a sort of elephant in the room, what happens to the Scottish TV industry if there is another independence referendum and Scotland votes to leave the UK? Alan, what do you think? What would that spell for Scottish TV industry, do you think? Well, obviously, as someone who grew up making a lot of political shows, I'm very well versed, particularly in a period of Purda, not to make any comment about that. Well, there's two interesting things. Firstly, no one has any doubts about how today's vote's going to go. Uh, and Nicola Sturgeon was actually on one of the debates saying, actually, I'm the only candidate in this debate for First Minister. Everybody else is running to be the head of the opposition, uh, which was a really interesting insight, whatever your views on the current First Minister. So assuming the SNP win either as a minority or majority party, then I think they're cultural and creative policies are very well set out in the manifesto. So I think the next two or three years is clear. To your bigger question, then I think, like everything, you would find a way, the way that, you know, the, the Irish have been very adept at not only running their own channels and making their versions of hit shows, but also becoming an absolute international hub for co-production with a Section 48 benefits in, uh, in Dublin's been such a big, big hub for drama production. So you would find a way, and yes, there would be a huge issue about Scottish people wanting to see Doctor Who and, and you know, Life on Earth or Coronation Street or wherever it, it might be, but there would definitely be a commercial deal be able to be arranged between an independent Scotland and network buyers. Because you've got to think the BBC is not going to not sell their shows to let's call it SBC, <laughs> are they, or agree to co-produce shows because you're very much in their interest to do so. So I think these can always be sorted out. Um, I'm not saying whether I'm in favour or against it. I've just said I don't, I don't think it's as insurmountable as, as you might think. Just to add to that, I think, you know, the, you know BBC Scotland Channel, I think it's been around, I don't know how many years it's been around for, not that long, but that is our channel in a sense. So I think... Um, for, uh, if we are independent, I think channels like that will be even more successful and maybe some other um, channels might pop up as well. Um, and because of that independence, you might find that Scottish people are more prone to um, looking within Scotland for, for more content as well. So, you know, it could be good for channels like BBC Scotland as well. And now it's time in the show for Alan and Stuart to pick their story of the week, the TV industry news item that's caught their eye in the past seven days. Alan, what's your story of the week? So my story of the week was the briefing by the BBC on the criteria of diversity in order to access the £100 million set aside in the BBC budget for companies that are diverse-led or are, have diverse crew or are working on diverse stories. And I think... As a straw in the wind for our industry, that is the most significant story from the last seven days. And that is that £100 million of 
existing commissioning budget over the next three years, right, from 2021 through to 2024. Correct. And the fact it was led by both Charlotte and Patrick shows the the significance and importance that the BBC attaches to this initiative. And this will be supported by a new mandatory 20% diverse talent target in all new network commissions from April 2021. Correct. Interesting stuff. Stuart, how about you? What's your story of the week? My story is the recent um, uh, No Clark allegations. Um, 20 women have come and said there was some sexual abuse allegations and also a couple more with um, bullying. That is um, the story I've been looking at for for myself as um, a black creative and someone working in television. I was truly disappointed and genuinely my re- my reaction was there's not many of us in the industry that can get to that kind of caliber to to, re- to receive a special award BAFTA and then it felt like it was taken away from us. And and from listening to that story, watching companies like All Three Media, All Three Media pull the plug on his production company, and also you know Sky and his own production companies is is failing now. It just shows how um, how fragile the, comp- the the industry is. There was something that happened you, you, um, a couple of years ago where um, you remember the old the old um, comedy uh, Roseanne. Um, and the the main character, she, you know, there was a racist remark that came out, and Roseanne was was supposed to be coming out the next year, and it all stopped just because of one person's comments. Everyone in that production, all cast, all crew, uh, jeopardized their their careers as well. So the upsetting thing for something like this, and running a production company myself, is look at how many people have ha- had some. It's had an effect on so many other people, production staff. Uh, production staff and you know think of the people that were in view viewpoint and they they pulled the last episode of viewpoint which is his most recent um drama one of uh, i'm currently making a film with um complicity theater in london um with what and the main character in that it was is in viewpoint as well so it's very close personal to me in the sense of this guy is saying look no one's watching Viewpoint anymore because of something No Clark had done. So it affected him personally. So, you know, it's something to think about. The wider impact, absolutely. There are allegations at this point, but I do believe there have been police reports about a, a report being made uh, in connection with, with this whole issue over the weekend. So obviously we'll see how things develop over the coming weeks. And now it's time of the show where my guests get to nominate their hero of the week and who or what they're telling to get in the bin. Alan, who's your hero of the week? I'm sorry, I'm going to be very serious with this section, though I always try and look in the lighter side of life. But my hero of the week is President Joe Biden. In his first 100 days of office, he promised to deliver 100 million vaccines. And he's actually delivered... 200 million vaccines uh, and my own son who who lives in New York and works in New York is only 29 and has already had his vaccine. So very quietly, without tweets, without bombast, he has delivered something exceptional for the American people. And conversely, my, what I would, my villain of the week and who I would put in the bin would be Prime Minister Modi in India, who has done the exact opposite. And even though there were warnings of a second major wave, held allowed religious festivals to go ahead, held major election rallies with mass crowds, and the the poor people in Mumbai and Delhi are are paying the price of that arrogance. Yeah, I believe they even uh, announced their victory over the coronavirus of just a few weeks ago, didn't they? His party. Um, yeah. So it was, it, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, really a tale of two leaders there. And, and you're right on Biden. I mean, what a breath of fresh air. Who? Donald Trump? Who? I don't know. Can we even yeah. remember him? <laughs> so it's a, a great vindication of boring guys everywhere. Yes, there we are. How about you, Stuart? Who's your hero of the week? I would have to say it's someone like Michaela Cole, director, producer, actress, doing really well in uh, BAFTA this year, BAFTA 2021, yep. and um, Steve McQueen's um, Small Axe. Yep. So 
I would actually say the both of them. <laughs> very good. <laughs> they're just very good. At, you know, they're giving us, they're, they're shining a light on um, our talent. So, yeah. Very good. And who are what you're telling to get in the bin, Stuart? And I have to jump on the ba- Alan's bandwagon and say the Prime Minister um, Narendra uh, Modi as well. And right. really, that has put, it's, it's affected me just seeing that, you know, seeing where we are just now in the Western world and, you know, people are out drinking and, you know, people are getting out in the world and there's people being, um, dying in the streets and, yeah. you know, being burnt. Shocking scenes. You know, you're this, right. Yeah. So that, that's the main thing for me. And also I'm worried that, you know, there's talking about African variants as well. I'm saying, you know, that that spreads out to to Africa, you know, yeah. and then, then, yeah, so. All right. So, yeah, Alan, thank you. I, was, uh, I mentioned Modi as well. A double bin for Modi. I That's believe. it. Yes, we don't get many of those, but it's a double bin. <laughs> Alan, Stuart, thank you so much for joining me this week. I could chat for a lot longer to you both and talking about Scotland. And let's uh, let's do that. Let's meet up in, a, in another year's time and see how things have developed up in Glasgow and across the wider Scottish country to see how the TV industry has developed over the next 12 months. Perfect. Thank you so much. That would be wonderful, Justin. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's about it for another week's show. As always, thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to Telecast and share it with friends and colleagues. And a quick reminder to sign up for our free newsletter called Telecast Plus. It's packed with interesting TV industry stories of the week you may have missed, exclusive insight and opinion, including The Secret Producer, our intrepid anonymous exec reporting from the front line of TV production. It's all completely free. Just visit our website to sign up at telecast-podcast.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn and Twitter. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in London. So until next Thursday, as always, stay safe. Thanks for listening to another Telecast. A quick reminder to sign up for our free weekly newsletter, Telecast Plus. It features interesting TV news stories from a different angle and exclusive content, such as Opinion and The Secret Producer, our anonymous TV exec reporting from the front line of TV production. Plus, we're bumping up the goodies with more free downloads of TV industry reports, discounts and exclusive access to some live Telecast events we're planning for the months ahead and you'll only get access to those if you're on our mailing list and don't worry we don't like spam either so we won't do anything weird with your data like sell it onto advertisers or anything just sign up at our website by searching telecast on google or visiting telecast-podcast.com thanks a lot